Well, good afternoon, everybody. How's it going? Glad you're here on this beautiful spring day. We are really, I'm pumped to have Nick with us here this morning, this afternoon. He's been at the both services before this. We've known each other for about five years and I uh, just love this guy and appreciate his ministry so much. He's a pastor over in western North Dakota, better known as Great Falls, Montana. It's a joke. They, whenever I go to Montana and visit, they always say, hey, you're from East Montana. Anyway, we get it. So anyway, I'm glad he's here with us. We're on our I Am series. We're talking about the sovereignty and the power of God. You guys know there's a medium coming to town here in about 10 days, and a group of us are going to go to that and pray and see what God will open up for us there. But as we talk about the sovereignty of God and the power of God and, and these different aspects of faith, where does that, what is real? And so Nick is going to share with us this morning about the, the real and the counterfeit. It's going to be awesome. It's been great to have him here. I'm glad you're here because you're going to get your piece of paper because you're going to want to take notes. It's good. So would you guys welcome Nick with me? Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Hey, I just want to commend your pastor. You guys have a great pastor and great leadership. You know, I come into a place and I'm like, wow, you have so many people mobilized in leadership. So would you give your pastor and his wife a hand clap just for all that they do? Thanks, you guys. And uh, wow, it's just been crazy. It's been busy, huh? We got Easter last week and then we're here this week. And then I get home tonight at 1230 at night and tomorrow morning, uh, we're sending a team to Mozambique, Africa for 16 days. And so uh, my wife's part of that team. So I want to get home and see her because it's going to be 16 days and I'm going to play Mr. Dad. I have five daughters. And so I get the thrill. Of, it's going to be chaos. <laughs> Pray for me, Okay. It's amazing though, I don't know if you've ever been to a third world country, but it's always the same. You, you come in and you go into places, whether it's Guatemala or Africa, and they always have these like markets, outdoor markets and funky smells, and you're walking along and all of a sudden you're like, look at that. They're selling Oakleys in Africa. This is crazy. They got Oakleys right here. and you, They're in the box and the case and you pick them up and they're kind of light, you know, and you put them on, you, you can't see out of them, but they're, they're only like $5. And, and they not only have Oakleys, but they got Ray-Bans, and it's the same gig. And I've come to figure out that they're not Ray-Bans, and they're not Oakleys. They're Folkleys, and they're Fay bands okay? <laughs> and uh, there, there's always a, a counterfeit for the real. The real is always more costly. The real is always more precious. And you can see a lot clearer through the real. It doesn't dilute you. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. When it comes to spiritual things, the Lord is like really, if I was to ask you this, how many people believe that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind? How many people would say that? Awesome. Three people. That's no. <laughs> so the Bible dictates our attitude with things, and it dictates our attitude with spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 14 will say, pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts. And what gifts he's talking about are the, 12, the nine that are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So if you have your Bible... We're going to talk about just what is a counterfeit anyways. And Paul's going to, he's talking to the church of Thessalonica, and he's going to say this. In verse 16, rejoice always, always, always be happy for whatever ha happens. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecy. So he wants to dictate our attitude on a couple of things. It's like you have the ability to quench the Holy Spirit, to grieve him. The Holy Spirit's not a force. The Holy Spirit is a person, has emotions, has feelings. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. And don't despise prophecy. The Bible gets to your attitude on that. The word despise has the connotation of disdain. Like, speak to the left, because you ain't right. You know what I'm saying? It's just disdain. It's like, oh, prophecy, oh. And, and if you have that attitude towards prophecy, Paul's saying, listen, no. Don't disdain prophecy. Don't despise it. And in verse 21, he's going to say, but test everything. Hold fast with what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And so when it comes to counterfeit things, it comes to spiritual things, Paul says, listen, chase after those things. Desire them, but test them out. Because Satan is the original counterfeiter. Isaiah 14, 14. Satan says this. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the Most High. So right away, who's the original counterfeiter? Satan. What is he trying to do? He's not an original, right? He goes, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to take what is good, and I'm going to mimic what God does. I'm going to try to mimic those things that he does. In Colossians 1.13, Paul says this. He has rescued us from the power of darkness. 
and has brought us into the kingdom of the son whom he loves. And, and so just a note on that. One of the things the Lord does is when we get born again, we're in, the king, we're, we're in the kingdom of darkness and he brings us out of this kingdom of darkness and brings us into his kingdom. In that kingdom that Satan has, he's called power of darkness. Now, I, I just wanna pause there because that word power is also the same word that is used for power of God. It's a Greek word called dunamis. And I remember like growing up, I'd always hear pastors say, dunamis, that's where we get the word dynamite from. And, and I don't know about you, but I'm thinking that's dangerous, right? That's just dangerous power because you know, I'm a little boy growing up and man, thank you Jesus for firecrackers and M80s. You know what those are, right? Because I lived next door to a girl, she'd want me to play Barbie with her. And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to do that. And I'd take M80s and duct tape them onto her Barbies. And I'd play Barbie Goes to Vietnam, it was awesome. You know how that one turns out, right? <laughs> and so, so it, it, yes, it does. Dunamis is the, the root word for dynamite, but that's really not what it means. Dunamis, you can look in Kittle's Theological Dictionary, 10 volume set. They do a really good word in defining words. And, and it says, dunamis is the ability to affect miracles. Wow. So it's the same word that says, you shall receive power to become a witness. Is this using right here for, for, for Satan? He, he rescued us from the power of darkness. Now, Satan is really a wolf in, sh in sheep's clothing. When we look at this in Matthew chapter 7, Paul's gonna, t or Jesus is gonna say, beware of false prophets. So anytime there's a false prophet, there's a genuine prophet, right? Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So what do false prophets look like? They look like one of the sheep. They try to dress themselves up like, wow, they look pretty good, but they're not sheep, they are, they're wolves, right? And you know the plan of the enemy. He's come to steal, John 10, kill and destroy you, a ravenous wolf. You will recognize them by their fruits. So how do we discern? Is this from God or not from God? How do I know what's counterfeit and not what's real? It's the fruit. Remember that old Wendy's commercial? Where's the beef? Remember that one? Where's the fruit? Whatever's coming out of it. So anything from God is gonna make you hunger after the things of God. If it's the Lord, you're gonna go, wow, that was Jesus, I just want more of him. But it's not God, you're gonna get diverted into things that are making you seek other things besides Christ. Jesus is gonna go on and say, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a diseased tree bear good fruit. So what is coming out of them, right? You wanna discern like, is this good? Is this causing me to come closer to God or is it not? In Romans 16, 17, 18, Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, mark, which, mark, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. For they are such, they don't serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by good wor uh, words and far, fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. And so essentially Paul saying to the church of Rome is like, watch out for these guys that are coming to you and they cause division. It, it, the, the Lord is all about us coming together, dwelling together in unity. Things that cause division, Lord saying, hey, watch out for those guys. They come in, their sole purpose is to divide you out. It's to separate you, it's to cause division and isms and schisms. In 1 Corinthians 14, three to four, the Bible, um, the Bible says that prophecy is good for three things. Biblical prophecy is good for edification, exaltation, and consolation. Are those words we use at all? Oh, thank you, Kurt, for the edification. Oh, by Joe, God, thank you, Nick, for the consolation. It means this, that whenever there's a prophetic word out, it needs to do three things in your life. It needs to build, it needs to strengthen, and it needs to comfort somebody. If it's not building you or strengthening you or comforting you and it's causing anxiety and it's causing stress, guess what? The fruit of that is not good, right? False prophets produce bad fruit. You know, there's actually true prophets lead people to Jesus. You know, there's actually a document in the early church. I always love it when people say miracles went out in the first century because gosh, man, I... I have a passion for church history, and I know that one of the early documents is going around about 150 AD is a document called the Dike. And the Dike is spelled D-I-T-A-C-H-E. And the Dike is essentially a document telling the early church, like, this is how you need to do church, right? I wish I had one of those today, right? This is how we do the order of service, three songs and an offering, right? 
this is how you do your church. And they, they, this document is going around, they go, we want you to be aware of anybody who is, is an apostle or a prophet, eagerly bring them into your church. However, right, so that's the attitude. And that tells me like in 150, 180, there's still prophetic ministry going on. Why would they write that, right? But they say this, the prophet that comes in or the apostle that comes in and they demand money, they're a false prophet. Oh, think about that TBN from, no, it's, <laughs> right? So it, 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 be aware of who you're bringing in. You'll recognize them by their fruits, right? Paul, Paul's gonna talk about that. Well, you'll recognize by the fruits and false prophets are gonna cause division. They're about the money. It's the prophet themselves and it's not gonna bring people to Jesus. Now, if there's a false, let's talk about what is the real, okay? If I am in the FBI and if I'm in their counterfeit, Bureau and studying counterfeit money. I don't study counterfeits. What do I study? The real thing. You want to be an expert in the real thing. You can study dollar bills and go, man, I'm so familiar with that that any variation, however small it is, when I see that, boom, something goes off in me and goes, man, that's a counterfeit. That's not a real thing. Now, here's the nature of the real, okay? Paul. Now, who is Paul? Well, Paul physically, most theologians say he's really short. He's like shorter than me. He's like four foot six, right? Kind of an ugly guy looking guy, they say, bow-legged, big, huge nose. And Paul, but he's trained under Gamaliel. And his dad is a Pharisee, so he's a son of a Pharisee. So he's very, very well educated. Most likely he had the first five books, the Pentateuch, memorized, probably fasting twice a week. But Paul's gonna come with a methodology that's completely different than how things would operate in the synagogue. Let's read this. And in Corinth, and, and the Corinth is just a wild place. In 1 Corinthians 4.20, he says this. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. Now, that's a lot different than a lot of American churches today, and I believe this. I believe that there's a lot of similarities between what Paul dealt with and what we're becoming and having to deal with, especially in large cities. Um, in Bismarck, it was funny because when I, I think I was telling Pastor Kurt, I go, man, your city reminds me exactly of like Great Falls. You know, we, we live kind of on the prairie, a lot of wheat farms and all this, same kind of architect and all this. I'm originally from Los Angeles, and... Um, and so I was just back, my mother-in-law passed away. And as we were driving through Long Beach, California, we literally drove almost two miles we saw, before we saw a sign in English. I mean, there's Cambodian signs, freeway signs were in Vietnamese, his Spanish signs. I'm like, wow, I'm in a whole nother world in this place. Are you with me on that? And Paul is in a whole nother world. Paul is facing multiple religions, multiple diversity of people. Like to give you an idea where I grew up in Long Beach, California, uh, a Baptist church that was just down the street is now a Buddhist temple. Where my wife grew up in Artesia, a Catholic church is now a Hindu temple. Are you, are you with me on that? You're looking at me like, that'll never come here to Bismarck. I hope it'll never come here to Bismarck, but things are changing very, very rapidly. And how do you minister to people who have no idea what you're talking about? Well, this is what Paul says. The kingdom, and wherever there's a king, the king has domain of God. It doesn't consist in words, but it consists in power. So, Matter of fact, Jesus, Jesus, teach us how to pray. We want to know how to pray like you. And Jesus gives them in, in uh, Luke 11 is the, the model prayer. And you know, our Father, our heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let me ask you a question right now. How many people are saved in heaven? Everybody in heaven is saved, right? When you get to heaven, people aren't gonna go around, like, this is so awesome. The tennis balls are covered in Teflon up here. This is like really cool. You're not gonna have that happen. Everybody in heaven is healed. And so as ambassadors to his kingdom, Paul says this, I want you to operate in dunamis power so that people will know that this thing about God is real. Now, when I talk about healing in Matthew chapter four, Matthew chapter 10, everywhere that Jesus healed, he healed everyone. Right? So what's my, what's my point on this? The, the, the kingdom of God is a lot more than just talk. The kingdom of God, Acts 1.8 says, you shall receive power to be a witness. Isn't that awesome? Just wasn't a few select people that were able to do this stuff. God said, I'm gonna fill you up, and then he's gonna go on, I'm gonna baptize you with my Holy Spirit, and you're gonna have power to become a witness in my kingdom. I, uh, 
I, uh, I, 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 I love the gift of tongues, but I probably like in the last three or four years, I kind of backed away just preaching on it because I'd never let anybody to Jesus speaking in tongues. I speak in tongues. I, uh, I know it's good for building yourself up. I know it's an intercessory gift. It's a spiritual warfare gift. There's a number of different things. We can sing in the spirit. We can do all these things in the spirit. But man, I like to see people come in the kingdom of God. I do a lot, a lot of street stuff in Portland and Los Angeles with YWAM and taking people into those cities and I've never led anybody to Jesus speaking in tongues. But we're in Portland, Oregon, with this girl who's from the Dominican Republic. Her primary language is Spanish, right? Her secondary language is English. So she speaks two, two languages. She comes up to a man, and she doesn't believe any of this stuff. She's raised in a tradition like, I don't believe this stuff happens today. I was taught this doesn't happen. You know, this stuff doesn't happen. An Arab man comes up to her, starts speaking to her in Aramaic, she understands them, right? She understands them, speaks back to them in Aramaic and leads them to Jesus. She, I don't, my Spanish isn't very good, but she is freaked out. She was excited, all right? And, and only to say this, right? I believe we're in a time and a culture that, man, we, if you do the stuff, isn't that how Jesus operates? In, in, in that when Jesus sits down in John chapter four, how did Jesus evangelize? He operated in power in the prophetic. Now, this woman is coming to your thing. She has a prophetic gifting, power of darkness. But what is prophecy? Well, the Bible said, and a lot of times when I talk about prophecy, people think I'm talking about end times. That's eschatology, studying about end times. I believe the Bible should interpret the Bible. So 1 Corinthians 14, 25 says, prophecy is knowing the secrets of a person's heart. And when you reveal those, prophesy them, they'll fall down on their face and acknowledge God is real. I had a first time visitor to my church, this guy. He'd gotten his girlfriend pregnant. She's like, hey, this is my boyfriend. I pray over him, start pray, praying over him and give him a prophetic word. The dude falls down to the ground, starts crying, going, this stuff is real. I'm like, this is like the Bible, go figure, <laughs> right? So the nature of the real is that you will receive power. It's part of the kingdom, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and it should be our priority. How did Paul do it? In 1 Thessalonians 1.5, he says this. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for, for your sake. So in Corinth, Paul's operating in power. In Thessalonica, Paul goes, you know, we didn't come to like with this apologetic. We came demonstrating to you the power of God. Let me give you an example of this. I'm in Portland, Oregon again. Has anybody ever been to Portland? Man, there's just a lot of homeless people, a lot of people living on the streets. And so I'm there again with YWAM. We're doing street evangelism. I'm with a Russian kid and he's like, Pastor Nick, I don't believe in any of this. And I'm like, okay, man. I go, dude, I, I tell you, dude is a Southern California term, sorry. Bro, we are gonna see, we're walk a block and I guarantee you we'll see at least two miracles. There's so many people out here, we're gonna see miracles. I just have the faith for that because I've done it so many times, like we're just gonna see something happening. So we walk from here to right here and there's two girls. I'm going, hey. I go, I feel like I got a message from God for you. Like, yeah, yeah, we don't speak, we don't speak English. I go, where are you from? They go, we're from Russia. I'm like, all right, man. This guy I'm with right here, he's Russian. Is that a coincidence, by the way? The steps of a righteous man, they're ordered by God. So I just happen to be with a Russian guy. We take two steps. We talk to two Russian girls like, this is Jesus. Isn't it awesome? And I go, ask her, word of knowledge, hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, John 10, 27, normative Christianity, my sheep hear my voice. That should be normal, right? Not weird. I'm like, freak out. It should be weird. Not normal, right? So I go, ask her if she was just in a car wreck. So he speaks to her in Russian. I go, were you just in a car wreck? She goes, yeah, I was in a car wreck two weeks ago. Her eyes get really big, right? I go, ask her if her neck is severely messed up. She goes, yeah, her neck's a mess. I go, I want you to lay hands on her right now and you're gonna see her neck get healed. He lays hands on her, starts praying for her. He goes, there's heat coming out of my hands. I go, I know, it's the Holy Spirit, it's awesome, right? He prays for her, boom, she gets radically healed. She's, she's Muslim, right? Her eyes are like, look, it was a good time, right? We walk down the street a little bit farther. We come against three transient people living in the streets. I come up to this woman, I go, hey, can I just ask you something? I go, I just feel like the Lord told me to come over here and pray for you. I go, 
Are you dealing with like no sleep? Like, are you traumatized at night and not being able to sleep, having crazy dreams and stuff? She goes, yeah, I haven't slept in days, man. I was just abused and I can't get out this out of my head and it's just going crazy. I go, well, I just felt like the Lord told us to come over here and pray for you. This is gonna be really cool. And so I started to pray for her. She starts to cry. And she starts crying. She goes, oh my gosh, oh my God, oh my God, I got peace. Oh my God, I have peace. I haven't felt that forever. Thank you, Jesus. And then she goes, can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah. She goes, you got this strange mystical present thing around you. Like, what is that? And I go, I'm bald, that's what it is. <laughs> I go, it's the Holy Spirit, right? And so, so we, the nature of the kingdom is all about power. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, that's how Paul demonstrated it. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5, Paul is saying, and when I came to you, brethren, I didn't come with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Paul could have easily got up and started preaching, but he goes, you guys remember this? Like when I came to you, it wasn't about me preaching or my good thing like that. For I determined to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my message uh, and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. Now here we are again in verse four, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Did you catch that? When I came to you, Corinth, I came demonstrating the, 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 the power of God and I want you to base your faith, not on my good speaking, I want you to base your faith on the power of God, which you saw. So let me just address this. Rams, in, in our Western culture today, in most high schools and university, we are taught, I was taught this, that the reason Christianity spread so, so profusely in the early church was because of Constantine. Constantine became the emperor in 310, 300 AD, and Constantine legalized Christianity. The persecution uh, ended and everybody became Christians. Isn't that what we're taught? There is a professor from Yale, okay? Now, if you're at Yale, probably above average IQ, right? And most think that Ramsey McMullen, and you can go on Amazon and check out all his books, is the leading expert on Roman history. He has written many books, at least 10 books he has on the history of Rome. He's not a Christian, but he writes an exciting title book, makes you wanna go out and buy it. It's called The Christianization of Rome, 100 to 400 AD. What an, ex woo! I wanna buy that book, right? And so, but in that book, Ramsey McMullen says, the reason Christianity spread so profusely had nothing to do with Constantine, that most of the empire was already Christianized and growing exponentially was because of the miracles and the signs and wonders that the early church performed. Bam. Are you with me on that? Everybody's looking at me like, wow, what does that mean? It means that if it worked back then, wouldn't it work today? Don't you think people are getting tired of religion? You know, I, I, I don't do well with religion. I do well with the reality of Christ. And that was always something in my life. I used to make fun of Christians at the University of Southern California. I used to laugh at them because I remember saying like, Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship. I'm like, what, is that? what does that even mean? Until I, I found out like, hey, this stuff is like actually real. And, and, and the prophetic and the, the demonstration of the power of God for me amazed me, right? Acts 2.22, Paul says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and sign which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourself know. Well, if God did signs, wonders, and miracles, can I just, listen, you can't have Christianity without signs, wonders, and miracles. You can have Buddhism without signs, wonders, and miracles. Buddha's just, Buddha came to try to eliminate suffering Right? You can have Hinduism without miracles, but can I just say something? Our whole foundation is based on a virgin birth and the death and resurrection of our Christ. And that's a miracle. Yeah. Right? Are you with me on that? So what should our attitude should be this? Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. Paul will go down later, and that's 1 Corinthians 14.1. He'll go down later in 1 Corinthians 14.39. He says, therefore, my brethren... Desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues. Well, you know what? There's our attitude, right? If I ask you, do you believe we should love God? Yes. But you know, when it comes to spiritual gifts and the context of what theologians would call the exegesis of that scripture is 1 Corinthians 12. 
I don't want you to be ignorant with these things. And there's nine gifts he lists. I want you to be well familiar with those because these gifts I've given you to give you power to overcome the kingdom of darkness, to deliver people out of that, to set captives free, to see people get healed up. I want to do those things for you. Isn't that an amazing God? And so I'll close up with this story. I, uh, I was in Northern California. Well, first of all, I got to brief this. Um, in geometry, anybody remember geometry? In geometry, the quickest way to A to B is a straight line, okay? And, but, you know, in God's geometry, the quickest way to A to B is a zigzag. And I think I can back that up scripturally because, right, you know the story of Moses. Moses, you're going to set my people free. Awesome, Lord. But you're going to have to go to the desert first and come back to this place. Joseph, yes, Lord. I'm going to do mighty things for you. Your brothers are going to come and, and bow down before you. That's awesome. But somewhere down the line, God didn't tell Joseph about, oh, and by the way, your brothers are going to sell you into slavery. You're going to be betrayed by Potiphar. They're going to speak bad about you. And you've got to go all the way over here to get to your point, okay? Well, what's my point on that? I uh, was speaking at a youth camp in Northern California for Foursquare. And it was like a day or two before I went up, I had a dream. I'm not a big dreamer, but that was so vivid. I remember waking up and waking my wife, Robin. I'm like, Robin. It's like, what? He goes, I just had the most vivid dream that we're going to go to Northern California. We're going to pass through Northern California. Ah, that's great. Go back to sleep. I'm up there speaking in Northern California. And Robbie Booth is this guy. He's one of our district guys at the time. And said, hey, Nick, would you ever consider pastoring up here in Northern California? I'm like, yeah, that would be awesome, man. I had just had a, felt like I had a dream. And he goes, well, I got a church of 200. And, and you could take over that church. I'm like, that would be good. I got five daughters. I, I don't have to be bivocational. I don't want to be bivocational again. So we leave a church of 2,000, and he miscommunicated. It was a, it was a, a, a town of 200, not a church of 200, to pastor a church of 20. And I listen, I'm born and raised. Like the first wild animal I saw, I was 38 years old, okay? And, and I've never, like, I'm from the city, right? And so my first funeral I, d I do, and this is a hunting culture, so this is safe to talk about this, right? If I, talk, I was talking about hunting in California at this youth camp, and this kid started crying. He's like, <laughs> I thought you were a Christian. <laughs> I'm like, bro, Deuteronomy 14.5, he gave us the deer, man. Come on, relax. And so I do a funeral. I do this funeral. And the first funeral I do, the guy, they go, hey, pastor, he didn't have very much money. Can we just give you like one of his guns for an honorarium? I'm like, sweet. I'll put this with all my other funeral guns. I go, like, this wasn't used to make him that way, right? I just want to be cool. And so, and I've never been hunting before in my life. So, uh, so uh, the, this big Bubba guy we had in our church, Jay, he's like, hey, can, can I take you out hunting? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Awesome. Well, you know, like, we get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Like, who gets up at 3 o'clock in the morning for anything? Are you with me on that? Like, how can this be fun? 4 o'clock in the morning, we hike out to this ground stand. So I'm on this ground stand with a loaded gun. And he's like, he's like I'm going to go over here, pastor. I'm like, okay. So he leaves me, and now I'm sitting there all alone. It is, like, so quiet, you know? And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I'm going to start, ah, ah. You know, I start riding a bowl. So I fell asleep. I, like, I fell asleep on this, like, pine needles, right? And I snore. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm snoring. And all of a sudden, you ever feel like something's watching you, you know? Like that feeling, like there's something here. And I'm like <laughs> snoring. And I wake up, and there are two bucks. They're looking at me. <laughs> like, this guy makes lovely noises. <laughs> this is wonderful, right? And, and I didn't know what to do because I never had, I never been that close to, like, like what do they do? Why do bucks? I don't know, right? Like, do they eat you? Or am I going to get antlered or something? And so I screamed, ah! And the deer run away. And this big guy comes running, Pastor, what's wrong? Pastor, what's wrong? I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. He goes, what, what, what's, what's wrong? Goes, there were two deer, like right here. And he's like, where were the deer? Like right here. He goes, did they have horns on? I'm like, yeah. City boy, you got buck fever. <laughs> I'm not really sure what buck fever is, but I know that's just not good. And, uh, and so everybody in town, I mean, it's like, you know, we just had like a gas station and an Ace Hardware and a pizza place. That was our town. And I'm walking in, and everybody's like, hey, pastor, how's the hunting going? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I'm this vendetta, like, I got to get a deer. I got to get a deer. And it's, it's like the last day of, uh, of the season, and I see this buck chasing this doe. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. And so I, I, boom, I shoot, and that deer, oof, like this. And it starts charging me. It drops its antlers down. It's coming at me. I'm like, ah! Trying to jack another round in that gun. I'm like, oh, and it, it just falls. And, and then it falls so bad because it's just laying there like. And I'm like taking my rifle. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> right? And so that's the, the, the town I'm in. And, and uh, 
in that small town, there was a lady there, and she was kind of like the town drunk. I think she'd gotten maybe like seven DUIs, and everybody knows her. And the reason everybody knows her is that when she drank, she would take her clothes off, and she'd run down the road. She got radically saved, okay? She starts coming to my church. So that's awesome because all the other pastors are like, is Barbara going to your church? I'm like, yeah, the naked lady goes to your church. I'm like, yeah, birds of a feather, man. <laughs> and so she comes up to me and says, hey, Nick. I go, yeah, what's up, man? She goes, I want you to pray for my daughter. I'm like, yeah, sure, what's your daughter? What's up with your daughter? Well, my daughter, Shawnee, she's a Wiccan practitioner. Now, if you know what a Wiccan is, she's like into witchcraft, and she's like the head of a coven. And I'm like, yeah, man, sure, no problem. And so I get in my car, and I start to drive. We're about 3,000 feet. I'm going to go up to about seven, eight thousand 8,000 feet up the Sierra Nevada mountains. And as I'm going up, it's a quiet winter day, and, and it's getting ready to snow. You know those days? We live, you know, in, in Montana and, and in North Dakota, but it's just, it's starting to get overcast. Real, it's a wet snow, big heavy flakes are starting to come down. And I'm driving up, I'm like, Lord, what am I gonna say to Shawnee? That was her name. What am I gonna say to her? And I'm listening to God, and, and I'm like, okay, God, you gotta help me out. And, and I felt like the Lord said a couple of different things. And so I get out of my car, and I go out onto this deck that they have, this redwood deck, and, and she says, hey, I'll, I'll go get my daughter. And she brings out her daughter. Now, you gotta put this in your mind. Out, and here come, out comes this, this young girl, maybe 23, 24 years old, and she's all dressed in black. She has this black, black stuff on, long black dress. She has black nail polish, black lipstick. She has a pentagram on and pentagram earrings, right? And so I look at her, I'm trying to break the ice, like, nice pentagram earrings. Like, did you get that at the Wiccan section at Walmart? Or like, how does that roll, right? And so we sat down and I go, you know, Shawnee, let's just get to the chase because obviously we're here to talk about spiritual things. And I go, the Lord told me a couple of different things about you when we're driving up the hill, when I was driving up the hill. And he, he told me that you received him in your life. You grew up in the church. When you're four years old, you had an experience with God that God came into your life at four. She's like, yeah, so? And I go, well, the Lord told me you're in three near fatal car wrecks. And each one of those, you felt like somebody pulled you out. And the Lord wants to let you know there's angels. And I was like, all right. And I go, and something you've never told anybody in your life. When you were 16 years old, I go, your youth pastor tried to bust a move on you. And you were so disgusted by him and so repulsed him that the reason that you're doing the thing that you do now is because you never, you said, I'll, I'll never set foot in the church again. And now she's starting to cry. She's like, oh my God, oh my God. I've never told anybody that. I've never told anybody that. I, I felt such shame and anger and all these things were on me. And I, I've never felt anything like that before in my life. I never told anybody that. And now I'm getting ready to close out. And I, I figured I'd do a wicked sensitive prayer. And so I, like the forest is all in there. And I go, Lord, I thank you that everything in the forest you created for Shawnee, the Lord, you created the trees for her that she could delight in. Now, remember, the forest is really quiet right now. It's starting to snow. And I go, Lord, I thank you. You, even, you created the birds in the forest for her to, to sing for her at her delight. And no lie, God is my witness. When I said that, out of the forest, all these birds start chirping. Like, ah, turkey, turkey. Oh, all these birds start chirping. I'm like, happens to me all the time. I'm like the bird whisperer, right? <laughs> and then I said, Lord, I go, I thank you. And this is the part that just freaked me out. I go, Lord, I thank you that you even created the sun to shine upon her. God is my witness. When I said that, just like that, like, like it was like, a, like God had a flashlight. A beam of light, the clouds clear, 20 degree instant heat change. The hairs on my arms stood up and a, a bolt of light right down on the two of us. And I think I said something really spiritual, like, oh my God, <laughs> I was totally freaking out, right? And uh, that Sunday, Sunday morning, next Sunday, she comes into church and she comes up to me and she goes, you notice anything? And I'm like, yeah, man, thanks for not wearing your pentagrams to church. That's really cool. And she goes, no, no, no. She goes, I'm a follower of Jesus now. She goes, there's more power with Jesus than there ever was in the darkness that I was involved with. And so as we close out today, let's do a couple things. I call this my church assuming the position. So I just want you to put your hands before the Lord. In our culture, we think, you know, as you heard the worship, as uh, pastor talk earlier, just about sometimes the awkwardness of lifting, hand, lifting hands and what does that even mean in our culture? We kind of lose the meaning of that. But in Hebrew culture, when I lifted my hands, it meant that, Father, I was going to get something from Father. And so, Lord, we come before you right now. We say, Father, pour it out right now. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us right now. 
baptize us right now. Lord, we're hungry. We're hungry for the more. We're hungry for more of you, Lord God. Father, empower us to be witnesses. Father, I pray a prophetic anointing over this congregation. I pray that signs, wonders, and miracles would happen. That, Father, as ambassador kingdoms, that we would walk and roll and move and operate and be naturally supernatural. You'd be like who you've created us to be. There's only one of us, Lord. You broke the mold when you got done, when you made Pastor Kurt. You can't be like Pastor Kurt because that mold's broken. He made you. And Lord wants you right now just to step into the power and the, and the movement and the flow of his power. It's part of your inheritance. It's part about being in the kingdom. That's why Jesus talks about the kingdom of God all the time. When Jesus releases and he goes out in Matthew chapter four, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, and it's in the connotation of, of signs, wonders, and miracles. Heals everybody, it's the gospel of the kingdom. You'll, you'll hear Jesus say that, the gospel of heaven, the good news. And the good news is this, that God's created you, put you here for this period of time. Don't miss your destiny. With God, he doesn't work by coincidences. He works by purpose, call, and destiny. And so, Lord, pour it out right now. If there's anyone here as we're praying who doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, coming into heaven has nothing to do with you being a good person. If you've ever told a lie, you are a liar. If you've ever stolen anything, you're a thief. If you've, Jesus says, if you've ever looked at somebody of the opposite sex with lust, you're an adulterer. You're a lying, thieving adulterer. You got a problem. I have a problem because the wages of sin is death. But this is what the good news is. Is we have a savior who loves you. John 3, 16, God so loves the earth. God loves you, he loves you, he loves you. The Bible says in Romans, while we were yet sinners, he came and he died for you. And he loves you so much and he wants you to be with him forever. But the only way you can get there in John chapter three, Jesus talking to Nicodemus, you must be born again, you must. And if you've never asked Christ in your heart, would you just look up at me right now and lift a hand up saying, that's me, I need to ask Jesus in my heart today. I need to make it, a, I need to ask Christ in my heart today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, pour it out right now. Pour it out right now. Thank you, Jesus. Is there a person in here right now you're having shoulder problems? Anybody with shoulder issues at all? right over here. So Father, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, come upon you right now and loosen that shoulder up right now. Father, loosen it up, I pray. The Father, pain would subside now in the name of Jesus. Mobility on your shoulder right now in the name of Jesus. Strength. Restructuring attendance. Can you move it a little bit? Father, just come upon you right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There's some people who've been dealing with some anxiety issues. I'm not gonna have you raise your hand, but this is gonna be really cool. Just let the peace of the Lord come upon you right now. Just let the peace of Jesus come upon you right now. Father, well it up, well it up. More, 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 more peace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Is there a person in here you, that you have a close person to and, and they have a tumor? Or are you here with a tumor? I just felt like the Lord saying, the Lord loves to heal cancer. Anybody that that you have in your family that is dealing with a tumor or cancer. Right back there. So Father, I pray right now. I pray, Lord, that you would just intervene into this woman's life. Lord, we just say, cancer, be gone now in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Kurt, I'm gonna pray over your church real fast because I feel like the Lord is getting ready for a visitation. And there's just something about your connect vision. The Lord is gonna allow you to connect. And I feel like this is gonna be one of many campuses. But, and I feel like the Lord's saying that there's been a pace. Like, you like, Lord, I wanna go faster. And the Lord is just saying that he's gonna, he's gonna build a foundation that will carry on with a legacy. Thank you, Jesus. And I feel like more help is coming along the way, more finances, more joy, more peace. And I feel like the Lord's saying, just wait. That's outside your nature. You are a doer, man. You are a guy who will get it done and drive and 
you need to understand what that is. But I feel like the Lord's saying that you're in a season of just, of just waiting on God. And the Lord's going to start downloading things to you. They're stirring in the midnight hour, just of, like you're always, always thinking. The Lord's going to start giving you vision and specifics. It's going to give you more details on the thing. And I feel like your wife has encountered you. Like you have a real, like, you don't pull punches. Like you see truth and you have a spirit of excellence and you just call things out as for what they are. And you guys are a good balance. And you're bearing truth on that. I don't know what you do, but I feel like, like you're, are you working right now outside of the church? And uh, the Lord, I feel like there's blessing and promotion. Like you, whatever you do, you do it really, really well. And uh, I feel like the Lord's gonna give you a promotion. I feel like those around you, like God's gonna do some shifting in those above you. And you're just gonna see more of an open heavens in the place you're at right now. Where there's very bit of frustration and you've had to bite your tongue and you've had to do those. That so God's gonna come with just greater promotion. And he's gonna give you time because that's a big thing. Because part of your thing is like, Lord, I need some time, man. I love my family. I love my husband and my church. And, and God's going to do that for you. He's going to give you creative ways. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray like even the possibility to be able to work out of home and work here. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, come right now. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. I just really appreciate Nick and his ministry and Thanks for coming over. Yeah, man, honored. For, honored, buddy. Honored. You guys appreciate him again. He'll be right down here if you want to talk to him. And thanks for coming, you guys. Thanks. Wow. Pretty awesome, huh? <clears throat> Would you extend your, extend your hands as we pray over the Connect cards? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today and every day. Lord, we just ask that you pour blessings over these cards, over the people that wrote them. We raise up the praises as much as the requests. God, you know everything that's been written on this before pen even hit paper. And we just raise these things up to you as a family linking arms. In your name we pray. Amen. Did you feel a tug today for the first time? And you're like, I really want to know more about Jesus. I, I got to find out what this is. But I'm nervous and I'm scared. And everything's a little gray and it's a little fuzzy. That's okay. We've all been there. But what I'm going to ask you to do is after service, go out through the doors to the Yes booth. And there's some amazing people there that want to give you a Bible, talk a little bit more about what the next steps are. Because they want to guide you through that. If you've been coming for a while and you're like, I just don't really know what to do, where to go. You know, I just feel like there's more than I'm supposed to be. Then go to the Access booth and get plugged in with them. There's lots of things that we can do to benefit the kingdom. If today during the message, you're like, man, I, I could really use some prayer. We can all use prayer. We have an amazing prayer team off to the side. But if you're sitting there today and you're like, I need more than just a prayer. I've been having a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, a bad year then we have an amazing pastoral care team that wants to walk that path with you and help you. If you're like, I don't, I don't really want to talk to anybody just yet, go online and hit that pastoral care button and fill out your request there and they'll be in contact with you. But just making that step forward is all it takes. Would you stand with me as we close with our series verse? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. Have a great week, church. God bless.